uh, last year criticizing U.S. foreign policy. What would you do differently, Donald? I'd make our allies, forgetting about the enemies, the enemies you can't talk to so easily, I'd make our allies pay their fair share. We're a debtor nation. Something's going to happen over the next number of years with this country because you can't keep going on losing $200 billion, and yet we, we let Japan come in and dump everything right into our markets and everything. It's not free trade. If you ever go to Japan right now and try to sell something, forget about it, Oprah. Just forget about it. It's almost impossible. They don't have laws against it. They just make it impossible. They come over here. They sell their cars, their VCRs. They knock the hell out of our companies. And hey, I have tremendous respect for the Japanese people. I mean, you can respect somebody that's beating the hell out of you, but they are beating the hell out of this country. Kuwait, they live like kings. The poorest person in Kuwait, they live like kings. And yet they're not paying. We make it possible for them to sell their oil. Why aren't they paying us 25% of what they're making? It's a joke. This, this sounds like political presidential talk to me. And I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. Would you, would you ever? Probably not. But I, I do get tired of seeing the country ripped Why off. Why would you not? I just don't think I really have the inclination to do it. I love what I'm doing. I really like it. Also, I, it doesn't pay as well. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I just probably wouldn't do it, Oprah. I probably wouldn't, but I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country. And if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally because I really am tired of seeing what's happening with this country, how we're, how we're really making other people live like kings, and we're not. What do, what Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody, you might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and this is episode 176. The day is March... March 13th, year of our Lord, 2024. And um, I'm going to talk about an issue tonight that's greatly controversial or that I expect to be greatly controversial, and that's okay. And I started this off today with, with this uh, throwback to, I think it was 1988, with uh, Donald J. Trump on, on Oprah Winfrey's show talking about trade, uh, America's foreign policy and, and, and trade agreements and, and uh global economy, and, and what it means to be America first from an economic standpoint, economic nationalism. And this is something that Steve Bannon talked about as well in the beginning and opening statements of his debate with, with David Frum. Uh, he talked about economic nationalism, and I remember uh, the crowd there in, in, in Toronto uh, laughing when, when Steve Bannon said, listen, the MAGA movement, the America first movement doesn't care about your race, doesn't care about your color or your creed or your gender or your sexuality. It cares about your citizenship. And everybody thought that was a joke. You know, everybody, everybody uh, you know, scoffed at that. They, they laughed at it. They sort of, sort of mocked him on stage there. But, but what Donald Trump is explaining right now to Oprah some 20, 30 years ago is exactly the backbone of the American nationalist populist movement today. And it is deeply rooted in our foreign policy. It is deeply rooted in our, in our uh, thinking about trade and, and our economy and what citizenship means and, and how these, I'm not talking about how you feel about it in some esoteric, you know, uh, global, we are the world humanitarian sense. I mean, how it really is, is dealt, how the deals were done, how the deals are constructed currently, who benefits, who profits, and is it fair? Is the agreement fair? And Donald Trump, you know, for, for all of the, uh, the criticism of his, his rhetoric and his, his, um, his imperfections, his, his moral shortcomings and, and so on and so forth. Some of the, some of the issues or, or things that he may be aligned with for lack of a better term, because I mean, there's a, there's a spectrum of them. I mean, every, every political, every politician, every political pundit, every individual citizen has their spectrum of ideas or issues and, and they fall somewhere on, on, on one side of a, a line or the other. So we don't need to name any specifically, but there are things that I disagree with Donald Trump on, but that's not the point. The point is, what are the priorities of the America First and MAGA movement? The priorities are the border, the debt, the forever wars. It's very simple. Why? Because those three issues are inextricably linked. 
to the depreciation of your citizenship. And your citizenship means something. It has to mean something. If you're a person without citizenship, if you're a man without a nation, if you're a man in, a, in, a, in an entire world or, or this sort of this shell of an empire, then you're a man without boundaries. And you're a part of a state which has obviously become a rogue government without boundaries. And we're going to talk about how that happened, but we're, you know, I don't want to make it be about Donald Trump necessarily, but it's hard not to. I mean, because he, he provides the, the, the prime example. And before we go into our, you know, our, our topic for the night, which is the, the crisis of femininity, the crisis of femininity and the failure of masculinity, we have a woman problem. And we really do, but it's not a woman problem alone because no, no, no being, no human person lives in, in, in society with, outside the context of everyone else. You don't live alone. You don't live in this world alone. We live with each other. And we are the sum total of, 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 of our sins, of our sins collectively and individually. Uh, say it the other way around. We are the sum total of our sins individually and collectively. If you go back to some of my podcasts with 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 A.J. Barker, he gave a great theological explanation for the the damnation of the souls of of all of those that followed Adam and Eve, because Adam is is our father, uh, the, the father of our species. And in that fatherhood, we take on that sin. So we there is there is a collective collective uh, sin. And, and if there is going to be a collective punishment, it, it shouldn't be done by man, but it will be done, and it has been done, as the Scripture tells us, by God. It's not for us to do. It's for us to tell the truth, for us to sort things out as best as we can, for us to be as logical and sane as we, as we possibly can. And right now we have a woman problem. We have a huge, huge woman problem, and most people don't even want to talk about it. They can't bring themselves to even say it. Why? We're going to talk about that in a moment. But first, before we do, I want to play our next clip here. And uh, I don't think that I could uh, have found a better one to articulate the woman issue that I'm, I'm referring to here in our, in our great country. Um, there we go. That way, I'm not the victim, right? I'm not the victim. You don't feel like a victim. I was not thrown on the ground and ravished. Which the word rape carries so many sexual connotations. This was not. This was not sexual. For it just it it hurt. It just what it just you know. But I think most people think of rape as a. I mean, it is a violent assault. It is not. I a think sexual. most people think of rape as being sexy. Mm. Let's take a short break. Think of the fantasies. Mm. We're just going to take a quick break. If you can stick around, we'll talk more on the other side. You're fascinating to talk to. <laughs> now, I almost wanted to play that. You know what? I think I will. I'm going to play that clip again. <laughs> because, I, honestly, I don't think there is a better, I don't think there's a better clip. Well, there is a better clip that I could play, and I think I'll play that in a moment, or maybe I'll end the show with that clip uh, a bit more ridiculous and obnoxious, but but also kind of illustrates uh, the, the, this crisis of femininity that's that's taken taken root in our society, really, especially from a political standpoint. But but this is at the center of, of American politics right now and and has been for some time and, and not just the Me Too movement, but but specifically Gene Carroll and uh, this this latest ruling against Donald Trump and what can only be described as a, a lawfare kangaroo court. Uh, and then that's exactly what it is. This is this is lawfare kangaroo court stuff that we're dealing with now, uh, and it, it has the potential to shape uh, the entire uh, election cycle of 2024. Now, hopefully, the American people, the American citizens, are smart enough to see through this stuff. But uh, you know, you can never sell short uh, the mainstream media's ability to control a narrative. That way, I'm not the victim. Right? I'm not the victim. You don't feel like a victim. I was not thrown on the ground and ravished. Which, the word rape carries so many sexual connotations. This was not, this was not sexual. 
for it just it it hurt it just what it just you know. But I think most people think of rape as a I mean it is a violent assault. It is not. I a think most people rape. think of rape as being sexy. Mm. Let's take a short break. Think of the fantasies. Mm. We're just going to take a quick break. If you can stick around, we'll talk more on the other side. You're fascinating to talk to. <laughs> and, you know, what is Gene Carroll talking about there? And Gene Carroll is talking about a society where sex has become taboo. And it has. And there's a sexual culture that undergirds the American, the American way of life. Uh, the modern American way of life that is all but unspoken about. And I'm going to start to speak about it here on this podcast because it's one of those Gordian knots that has to be untied, if nothing else, then first to help uh, to help clear a pathway for us to move forward uh, as 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 a nation, as citizens, but but really as as a species. I mean, that's that's a lofty goal. Don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not saying that I'm going to be able to do that with, with this podcast alone. But what I am saying is uh, that that somebody has to start to have that discussion. And why not us? Why not us? Let's have that that conversation. Um, we have a man and woman issue. We really do. We have a man and woman issue. And the issue is something like the standards, the, the, the ethics of sex have not been sorted out. And Jordan Peterson talked about this many years back, but, but I, I still don't think people really wanted to have to, to acknowledge and, and then deal with what he was saying. And, and what he was saying, it, it was more related to um, the, the, the Me Too culture that had popped up on college campuses, which he was obviously very familiar with being a college professor. But... Um, there was a sort of, of, of a conflation of, of, of morality and, and ethics and, and thinking, general thought, about what constitutes as sexual assault and rape on college campuses. When you have bar life, when you have a sort of open sexual culture, experimental sexual culture and things of that nature, uh, there, frat culture, you know, sorority culture. I mean, there's so many other, there's so many dynamics for young people coming into an age where some of them for the first time are, are experience in sex and, and, and out on their own and get to make some of those decisions with more of their own responsibility uh, as individuals. We all know that, that that's a, that's a reality, um, certainly in our, in our country. But he was saying, you know, we haven't even sorted out what the, what the, what the boundaries are. And so we're using all of these words and these words have, have heavy, heavy implications, serious, serious allegations uh, when you talk about rape or sexual assault, and and to you know to to sort of arbitrarily apply these words to to any and every experience that you have individually that that you may be unhappy with or 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 whatever the case may be. I mean, it's hard to even describe it, but 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 that's dangerous, it, and it is dangerous. And I guess for us in the black community, I mean, we automatically think back to Emmett Till, right? where the country was a little bit more racially charged and a, a white woman said that a young black man, Emmett Till at the time, had uh, you know, made a pass at her, right? made an advance at her, uh, winked at her or whatever, the, the, you know, whatever it was that she said at the time. And consequently, he was killed by you know, a few white men, beaten to death. Famous you know, story of racism in, in our nation's history. And it was later, it was later admitted on, on her deathbed uh, that, that she had lied. On Emmett Till, and and she what what she had said, uh, he did. He in fact didn't do, and that's not the first time. It, that isn't the first time. That's one example of uh, black men in the black community here in America having been lied on, uh, in many cases by a white woman. Uh, and I, I don't mean to make it racial, but it, it just was a cultural sort of phenomenon that a young white woman would be caught or be found out to have had sexual relations with a black man in an in a environment where she may interpret it as um, shameful or, or uh, un, unacceptable to her family or community standards, for example, and, and in turn decide to lie. 
Long story short, my white dad wouldn't approve of me having sex with anyone, let alone a black man. And so I'll just lie and say that he that he raped me. And those aren't the only situations where it's happened. We also see a number of situations where men no longer want to have a, a, a relationship, no longer want to talk to to certain to, to a woman, no longer want to be involved with them romantically. Maybe uh, they felt led on or, or thought that the relationship was going to be something more than it ended up being. And 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 so they they resort to the same the same tactic. And my point and my point in bringing this up is not to say that every woman who says that she was sexually assaulted or raped is lying because that's ridiculous. I mean, we know as Jean Carroll sort of alluded to, in her mind there is a there is a definition of of rape that she has working, and in that definition, it's a man forcefully physically throws a woman to the ground and 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 you know has sex with her against her will, and that's the uh, that's the depiction that that most people get when they think of the word but she also alluded to something else and that something else is so so insightful to the lack of ethical standards and and sort of boundaries uh, or or uh, you know one common uh one common working definition that we have uh, around sex and, and sexuality and sexual boundaries and we do need to sort this out I mean, we we have to sort this out, and I'm going to explain why in a moment. But but what else she alluded to was this sort of fantasy of rape, and that people think of rape as sexy. Now, when the first when I first heard the clip, in the context of the Ian Jean the 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 Jean Carroll story, and 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 the fact that it's on CNN and this is mainstream media, my first my first impression was, whoa, this this lady's nuts. This lady's crazy. And I do think that she's quite crazy to allege that he did what he did and then come back and say that in this context, uh, that Donald Trump did what he did and then say that in this context. However, the substance of what she's saying is vitally important for us to to deal with. And the the reality is there is a pervasive culture of uh, what some would say is sexual depravity, but it, 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 it in the interest of not condemning people for their sexuality and their, their you know, their sexual proclivities, let's call it, um, let's call it hardcore porn style sexual fantasy, okay? And, and look, I know, I know in this conservative movement and the conservative audience and the people that are probably listening right now, look, if you can't talk about sex, if you get squeamish around sex, you're probably a 501c3 Christian. I'm just going to say it. You're probably a 501c3 rhino. You're into the, you're into the presentation of, of righteousness. You're into the presentation of, of conservatism. You're into the presentation of patriotism and, and American citizenship. You want it to be presented away whether it's that way or not. And that's, that's the way we got here. Don't get me wrong. Look, we didn't get here because the internet proliferated a pornography culture. Now we have a sexually decadent America that has now spread its wings and, and started to fly over, casting a shadow on the entire country. We didn't get there because of that. We got there because things took place and we were unwilling to even acknowledge them. We, we were so sort of uncomfortable with the dialogue, with the conversation. We would rather turn our head than, than actually engage in it. And, and, you know, that's how you ended up with with LGBTQ agenda books in your in your schools that talk about sexually perverse things. And and you're none the wiser or you really have no control over. Them. That's how it happened. I told Professor Penn the other day when we were we were having a conversation about this very issue, I said. It's somewhat ironic that that the uh, the, the Christian community here in America often gets squirmish uh, about sex as a topic can't even deal with it yet it's going to be that very issue that unwillingness to deal with that issue that's going to be the 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 weapon used to take your rights and eventually make it so you can't practice your faith you want to know how get a woman to say that a man sexually assaulted or raped her that's challenging the status quo and make that the sole source of the the rally against him from the woman, the female voters, the women voters, the women uh, uh, um, citizens. Use that as the narrative to to make sure that another globalist puppet gets into office, like Joe Biden, who says he's a Catholic, 
but he basically lists white Christians, white nationalists, which really means white Christians, people who believe in God, people who oppose the LGBTQ agenda. He lists them as radicals, as extremists, as the, the, the extreme Republicans. Domestic terrorism. I got that. I got the, uh, the national strategy for countering domestic terrorism sitting right here on my coffee table. I thought it was one of the most abhorrent documented documents, sorry, one of the most abhorrent documents I'd ever read in my life or I'd ever seen in my life from an official government agency, from the White House. But it is fruit from the same poisonous tree, and we have to understand if we're not willing to tackle this issue, if we're not willing to be, to be righteous uh, and, and stand upright when it comes to this issue, we're doomed. We're doomed. And there's a lot of 501c3 rhinos. There's a lot of never Trumpers. There's a lot of Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley people out there that that will use the, the story of Gene Carroll as as, you know, as ammunition, as gunpowder for their assault on Donald Trump. And they want to make it personal. But this isn't a personal matter. This is about the ideas. And one of the ideas we definitely need to sort out is this idea about the the the, the rift between men and women. And there is a rift. There is a rift. The rift is, is something like it's always safe to build a political movement on the oppression of women. Why? Well, it's, it's obvious. We can use the, 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 the oppression of women, the natural physical difference between men and women to you know, create a rally cry. Identity politics in this country and around the world is predicated on two groups. The, the real history of race, racial division, racial, racial thinking, which none of us can deny. We see it all across the world, not only between black people and white people, but they're in China, between different tribes, they're in Europe, between different tribes, they're in Africa and, and, and the Middle East, between different tribes. So we, we see this sort of this sort of uh, division and oppression based on physical appearance or, or a pro uh, proximity and location geography, we see that throughout history. That's a very real, substantive, evidence-based divide that, that we, can, we can refer to all across history. And then there's the, the natural differences between men and women. When in some times throughout history, men have been very, very tyrannical to women. And it, and it calls into question, it, well, what is the answer? And I'm not going to give the, I'm not saying I have the answer now, but, but first let's start to ask the questions. Do we want to go back to a time when women can't vote, where women don't have freedom of speech, where women are the property of men? I would say no. I, I don't, I'm not on that train. I'm, I'm not in that cohort. Take away the woman's right to vote. Take away the, the woman's uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Take away the woman's right to work. Take away the woman's right to um, <coughs> to be her own citizen, right? Should we go back to a time when men were able to own women outright as property? I'm not in that cohort. And, and, I, and I invite anybody to, to step up and challenge and debate. But, but what we, even for the people who are in that cohort, cohort, what we have to acknowledge is if we had treated women better when, when that was the setup, then none of them wouldn't have, then they wouldn't have defected from that format the way that they had. All of it couldn't be brainwashing. Again, when when the when Marxism and, and, and communism was was foisted upon the American populace back in the sixties, uh, and the American populace rejected it, it was mostly because many Americans saw free trade and capitalism as a better pitch than communism and Marxism, because they had economic mobility. And so there was something fundamental that had been offered, that had been seen, that had been recognized in the traditional sense of the American dream that wouldn't let communism and Marxism take root. The same thing must be acknowledged with the dynamic between men and women. When men did have women as property, on a broad basis, we didn't do too good of a job with it. Now, does that justify women allowing that history to be used as, as a, a weapon against the freedom and liberty of all people 
any and everywhere all around the world? Absolutely not. And that is how it's being used. And in that way, women, you, you, you don't get a pass. You don't get a pass because your, your, your 10th generation grandmother was, was, you know, sold around or shopped around like a, like, like, a, like a piece of cardboard or a piece of lumber. That doesn't excuse the sin that comes from the, this, this new justification that, that the protection of women be the cornerstone of all global agendas that take people's freedoms and liberties. I mean, imagine we're talking about giving women freedom and using that to justify taking away everybody else's freedoms. And I don't even think they really want women to be free. I think they want to give women the illusion of freedom. And part of that illusion is obviously the right to choose being the backbone of the, the women's rights political movement. If we can convince women that they are powerful by having the right to choose, having the right to abort their babies, the, the only thing that they have that's unique to their species, it's not the only thing they have that's unique to their species, but, but from a biological standpoint, it's the sole thing that's unique to their species. If, if we give them control over that, if we give them control over reproductive rights, now they're powerful. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that. But I think there's a deeper pitch. The real pitch is, and, and this, is, this is really at a satanic level. It's not just the abortion. That, that's, that's a piece of it. But the real satanic level of this is if we can get women on the same page as a political movement, then we can hijack the reproductive system of men. We can tap into the, the, the biological impulses and reproduct. We can, we can tap into the biological engineering of the men. And what we see now and what we've seen progressively over the last, I don't know, 40-odd some years since the proliferation of television and content and, and entertainment and sex and pornography and the whole thing, what we see is if you get enough men in a room, in most cases, the will of men will bend to the arc of women's desires. And they'll say that they're doing it because they love women or because they want to protect women or that they need to protect women. But really, if you if you if you if you're a man and, and you've been in the locker room, right? You've been in the locker room when 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 there are no women there, you 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 know, you know that men put on an entirely different persona in front of the women than they do when they're in private with other men. And I don't I don't say that to to try and out men's, you know, secret culture in the secret club. It's it's not really to do that. It's to say, why are you fronting? Stop fronting. Stop fronting. That's all you're doing. You're not doing this to protect women. You're not doing this to to help women be more more free. You're you're doing this to to uh, most men who have been uh, who have conceded to to this male feminist culture that's that's you know spilled out all over the world this this male feminist uh, sort of uh thought process most of them are doing it purely to help their chances uh in the sexual marketplace and and in that way in in their reproductive uh in their reproductive life. Some of them don't even realize, probably don't even realize that they're doing it out of that, that biological reproductive impulse. But they are. Some of them probably tell themselves consciously, I don't want to have kids. I'm not doing this because of children. But subconsciously, the brain is telling them they have to keep their, they have to keep their options open, as many options open, as many roads open as possible in the sexual marketplace, in the reproductive marketplace. And this is the level that Satan's playing at. And people have to at least, at least ponder, is this what's going on? Like you put yourself on trial. Put yourself on trial with, with some of these things, with the thought process, with your own thought process. I see it. I see it clear as day. And, and you say, well, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about porn? Are we talking about Me Too movement? Are we talking? No, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Secretary of State Blinken. I'm talking about Secretary of State Blinken and the entire identity politics movement being so pervasive that that Secretary of State Blinken 
puts out a memo to the other people in the agency and, and, and it has this list of, of, of words that we can no longer say because of how far advanced this, this identity politics thing has gone. Can't say grandfather or grandmother or, or you know, there was a list. You can look the list up. There was a list of things that we should no longer say. Daughter, son, you know, it's just it's crazy. Cra I, I, absolutely ridiculous. And it has to do with identity and pronouns and gender and sex. And, and all of it is making the claim that in order for us to protect women, we have to expand this culture where men can only show their love and appreciation for women if they affirm any and every political or philosophical idea that they have. And there is nothing more inappropriate than that. There is nothing more dishonest than that. Than that. There's nothing more illogical than that. If you believe that, that in order to show your love and appreciation and respect for women is to affirm any and all of their ideas solely based on the fact that they're women and traditionally throughout history, men have oppressed them, then I think you're only doing it to try and get laid. I'm just going to come out and say it. You're doing it to get laid. And no wonder we have a jerk-off society. No wonder we have a cuck society, and we do. And when I say jerk off, don't die a jerk off. People may not understand what I mean. Or when I say, uh, that, you know, this person's a cuck or that person's a cuck, people don't understand necessarily what I mean. In fact, on X, when I say it, a lot of times people respond and go, I don't know if you know what that word means. No, I know exactly what it means. I don't think you understand the context of your life, your citizenship, especially as men out there. You men are being cucked and it, it, you're, you're, you know, you're... you're <laughs> The entire woman populace's daddy is the government. And it's a big government. It's, it's an overgrown government. It's a tyrannical government. It's a government that's completely out of control. And that is that has become the hallmark of the women's rights movement, that we will trade our freedoms to expand the government because the government, government expansion, the expansion of the federal government, is the only way to ensure our freedom, and, and even more shallow than that, our right to choose. And this is why the right to choose seems to be at the, you know, at the, at the foundation and the bedrock of all women's political thinking. And no matter what Donald Trump says, like there with Oprah Winfrey, who couldn't be described as anything other than one of the most four, uh, foremost uh, popular women's rights advocates on the entire planet, there Donald Trump was with Oprah Winfrey back in the 1980s, and they're talking about economic nationalism. The same ideas Donald Trump is talking about now, and Oprah Winfrey seemed very open to the ideas, as a matter of fact. She didn't berate him. She didn't say he was crazy or a loon. Or, she actually said, hey, this sounds like presidential talk. You know, this sounds like the type of ideas that are so broad in their scope that, that you, you may be thinking about running for president. Because even back in the 90s, the writing was on the wall with our trade agreements. And, with our, and, and my point is, you can't even talk about the economy as long as women, as long as women are having a throwdown about the Roe, Roe v. Wade, about abortion, about a right to choose. And, the, you, know, and the, you know, I don't mean to say that women are selfish, but I will say that we have created a, an outrageous culture in our society where the the self-centeredness of the entire female ethos especially here in America and in the west is out of control it's completely and utterly out of control it really is and don't get me wrong i'm not saying that men aren't egocentric and self-centered because that's obviously uh, equally ridiculous but there is a sort of there is a sort of caricature in in nature to the to the the woman version of it and the politics show it. I mean, the politics really tell, tell, us, tell the story. They really do. Because the female vote comes down to one issue in many cases. And, and there's nothing remotely appropriate about that on face value. I mean, if the litmus test for you as a woman is, oh, where is the candidate on the right to choose? Where is the candidate on Roe v. Wade? You, you, you know, you, you're caught. You're, you're caught in the, in the, in the zeitgeist. You're caught in the brainwashing. You're called the psyop, really, and it is a psyop because there are so many other issues 
And the fact that that one issue only affects you. Look, I don't I don't like it when we as politicians try and find the the key issues that that kind of speak to the broadest group of people who feel disenfranchised or underserved. I don't even like that. I want people to have an understanding of a good number of issues that affect them at the most base level as citizens. And what Donald Trump did with Roe v. Wade, many conservatives say isn't conservative enough. He says, give it back to the states. Let the states decide. The way it was intended by our founding fathers. The way our government was supposed to be set up. Let the states decide. Now, you can make a Christian argument, you can make a religious argument that the, that the moral standing of our entire nation will be collectively judged upon what we allow to happen through legislation. And, and there's a completely legitimate argument to make there. And, and in fact, I would say that Scripture supports such an argument. However, I would also state that throwing it back to the states was a, a step in the better direction. It really was. And so women, if you want to be able to, you know, you, you want the right to, to, to choose, you do have a right to choose. You have a right to choose in a state that allows it versus a state that doesn't. And you can go to a state that allows it. You can move to a state to, that allows it temporarily even if you, I mean, so there, there are answers. But the, the point is, and I'm not advocating that you do that, but what I'm saying is this isn't the end all be all. I mean, even the way that the legislation is said, even the way that, that Donald Trump has, has contributed to the way that the, the, the legislation is said, this isn't a be-all, end-all issue. But your freedom of speech you're willing to give up? Your freedom of expression you're willing to give up? The rights of your children, whether you want to bear them and, and, and have them born into the world or not, the rights of your children you're willing to give up? The rights of your fellow men and women you're willing to give up? The rights of the black people that you all say that you're supporting and advocating for you're willing to give up? I mean, the integrity of your, your politics, the, the integrity of your activism starts to crumble on itself when you ask those follow-up questions. And what it all boils back down to is, no, you don't care about those things. You don't care about their rights. You don't care about the Uyghurs in China. You don't, you know, it's not about women. You don't care about the women in East Turkestan. You don't care about the Uyghur women who are being thrown in the concentration camps against their will, probably, probably raped, probably sterilized, or forced to have a child. I mean, who knows what, what weird, kinky stuff is going on there in China in, in, in those concentration camps. You're not worried about those young girls that are getting carted off to concentration camps. You're not worried about the Uyghur hair that they found in the shipping container that was being shipped as, as bundles of weave you're still buying the weave nonetheless. And, and I hate to get down on women like this. I just feel like I, 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 I continuously watch a culture that is, that is growing and, and spilling over where men won't even say it. It's disgusting. And then they think that, and these men, you know, fancy themselves serious. You won't even talk to the women straight. And this is why your women don't respect you. This is why most of your women don't like you. This is why most of your women find a more edgy, more, more sort of assertive, dangerous, dangerous uh, lover behind your back. And that is the cuck fantasy. Now, it's often de depicted in a sort of racial dynamic, right? And it, it has to do with, you know, a, a, a certain, a certain uh, prejudice, bias, a certain, a certain uh, you know, folklore, you could say about how men, men of a certain race are endowed versus others. And, you know, all of that stuff is, is too scientific for me. I, I'm, I don't know. Not really interested. Don't, don't really care about it. But I'm just trying to explain the cultural dynamic. And a lot can be learned from the things that we have fetishized and that have become popular on the Internet. M much can be learned from it. Now, maybe you 501c3 Christians aren't willing to go there because you don't want to see just how how decrepit and, and decayed the, the underbelly of this country really is. But if you've been there and you know it there, then you have a very clear picture of what's going on. And that's why I have to speak to it. But there is, a, there is an epidemic of women out there who say that they want this, you know, this man bun wearing, uh, um, you know, eclectic, uh, sort of, uh, you know, Judeo-Buddhist, uh, you know, meditative, uh, you know, uh, three-quarter three capri pant wearing, uh, you know, you know, open-toe sandal uh, with, with the, uh, 
I, I don't even know. I don't even know what material they're wearing. You guys know the shirts with the droopy hat and, and the whole deal. There's a lot of women out there who say that they want that guy. Number one, they're not getting married to that guy. Number one, they're not staying with that guy. There's low reporting of these, these liberal relationships being long-term relationships. Number three, they end up cheating on that guy with the guy who's actually more assertive. And in that more assertive relationship, not only do they like a man who's more aggressive and more assertive, but they like a man who's a bit rough. And the evidence shows that. I mean, I'm not just making this up. There's a reason why Fifty Shades of Grey was the number one selling book in the demographic of women that age for years. There's a reason why Fifty Shades of Grey became the literary phenomenon that it was. How do we explain that? And, and that's what Jean Carroll was talking about. That, that sort of uh, sexual dominance rape fantasy. And we can all pretend like it doesn't exist, fine. If that's what you guys want to do, that's okay. If it's too taboo for your little ears, that's fine. But don't let them, don't let them witch hunt a president of the United States of America that is bringing ideas that affect the entire fabric of our way of life based on this issue that we really don't even want to deal with. Please don't let them do that. I mean, when you talk about letting your country down as a citizen, that would be right up there at the top of all time shameful ways to go. I mean, if a country's going to burn, that is probably the all-time most shameful way for it to go. That, that sex was so taboo, that we created a culture that was so perverse, so sexually boundaryless, that when the moment came for us to speak up, we were all too gun-shy, we were all too, too squeamish to even talk about it, and we watched a man get witch-hunted and carted off by a kangaroo court? And with him, with him, our dying hope of having a country or a government that would even remotely stand up for our freedoms and the integrity of this republic? Wow. Wow. You can't really count yourself an American. You can't really count yourself a good person if that's how you're going to do it. I may be saying a lot, but I don't think that I am. I really don't think that I am. Maybe I am. Maybe I am. I don't think that I am. But I want to show you another clip here. And this is more, you know, fruit from the same poisonous tree. This is, this is uh, more of the same here from, uh, from CNN. And they always get a black woman. I mean, that, that's another go-to move. They get a black woman. They get a liberal white woman. She brings a black woman on the show because, you know, we got to have diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and and this is the this is the dangerous this is the this is the ugly way that diversity equity and inclusion is is used to control the narrative that and that's what that's what it is. Hey, is diversity a thought good? Is diversity good? Is inclusion is including people good? Is equity good? I mean, economic equity, social equity. I don't even know what it means. I know what they say it means. But it really doesn't mean that because there's no equity of people who think differently than they do. So the whole thing becomes a scam. But the, the words themselves aren't the scam. The ideas themselves aren't the scam. It's just the people applying them. Here's an example right here. You can't say that, that the people who are crossing our border illegally are illegal. Wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me get this right. I just want to see if I got this right. I can't say that a person who comes across our border illegally is illegal, but we can call Donald Trump a racist, uh, not a racist, we call him that too, but we can call Donald Trump a rapist even though he was not found guilty in a criminal court for sexual assault or rape. So I can't call an illegal immigrant who comes across our border illegal, but we can call Donald Trump a rapist even though he wasn't convicted of rape. Are you starting to see how absurd this shit has really gotten? Here we go. But also on, on the term he used, illegal, there's some, been some backlash among some in his own party for using that term. Look, it was clear being in the chamber last night that there were those uh, on the extreme Republican Party who were trying to bait the president. Uh, into uh, responding to whatever heckle they were offering, uh, offering. It's unfortunate that the president used that language. I don't believe that is the language that, believe, that he believes in his heart about 
uh, immigrant people who find their way uh, to this country to make a better life for themselves. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Joe Biden uh, talked about uh, an illegal immigrant being responsible for the for the death of of a of a young woman <coughs> in our country, and uh, and this is them. Uh, you know, L- Lake and Riley. I'm sorry. Uh, talked about the 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 death of Lake and Riley being resp- You know, the, at the hands of an illegal immigrant, and um, you know, this is them coming coming right behind, playing bat and cleanup, making sure that Joe Biden can say whatever it is that he wants to say or not say whatever it is he needs to say, and they come back and explain it away so that that everybody believes that Joe Biden is still fit to be president. That's all these people are doing. I mean, this is the neoliberal, neocon world order at play. This is the neocon, neoliberal, mainstream media industrial complex. And this is what they do. Joe Biden said exactly what he meant to say. It was an illegal immigrant. He came back a day later and because he, he had some scrutiny from the, 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 the more extreme left wing of his party that is now in, in increasingly fast becoming the moderate center of the entire political spectrum that for some reason believes we shouldn't be able to say that illegal immigrants are illegal. It's ridiculous. We, we, we can't say what is illegal is illegal anymore. This is, this is an actual infringement upon the freedom of speech. This is the soft coup on the freedom of, of speech and freedom of expression. And in some ways, the freedom of press. And in many ways, through the, the corporations and their collaboration and their, their uh, in, influence and, and their ability to, to control the narrative at such a broad level, their monopolization of, of information and, and, and everything else, it's almost become, you know, taboo to, to be an American citizen. You, even, you can't even say American. The American flag has become a microaggression. We can't say that people who cross our border are illegal. We can't say that people who cross our border illegally are illegal. We can't say that immigrants who come into our country without documentation, without going through the process are illegal, but we can say that Donald Trump is a rapist even though he wasn't convicted in the criminal court of law. Nobody, you don't have a problem with that, women? I mean, I, I, okay, I mean, this is the same, and, and mind you now, I, I know that in secret, a lot of you women, a lot of you feminists, a lot of you women activists find yourself higher up the totem pole than the black man. That's obvious. I mean, that's obvious by all of your, your activism. I mean, because when your activism, uh, it becomes threatened by, by heterosexual black men and, and the things that we want to voice about what our priorities to us, you always become Karens. And then you want to, me to us, you want to say that we're misogynoir, misogynistic, or we're, we're transphobic, or we're xenophobic, or you, you're quick to throw us in, in the same pot with the MAGA extreme Republicans at the drop of a dime, and, and then our black identity, our black oppression, our black existence, our, our black experience means nothing. As soon as we disagree with you, and this is a hallmark of narcissistic women, that, that their own beliefs and ideologies are thrown to the wayside as soon as they are no longer emotionally invested or aligned with the people around them. They will go nuclear. We, we, it, it's tried and tested. It's tried and t- oh, as a matter of fact, I don't think there's a better example we could use than the than the Roe v. Wade example. I mean, in in, in a sort of a revelatory, I- ironic uh, corollary right here in real time, I think it was uh, Norma McCorvey. Yeah, I think that was her name. Norma McCorvey was the star witness in the Roe v. Wade case. And, and she wanted to have an abortion in Texas. And, and because the laws ruled against abortion, she thought that it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do to lie and say that she was raped by four other individuals, including another woman, in order to achieve being able to have an abortion. And she admitted that she lied about being raped. And, I, okay, so let's say you want to have an abortion. I mean, let's say that it's illegal. 
And let's say you want to come up with some lie to be able to try and have an abortion. You know, my, my thoughts on the immorality of that aside, the fact that you would then go to say that you were raped by three individuals and even more so that you would throw another woman under the bus in your pursuit. I mean, how could you claim to be an activist for women? I mean, isn't that sort of one of those, you know, one woman, you know, woman on woman crime. If one woman tells a lie on another woman. She's kind of lying on all women. I don't know. This has just become common in our country. And that, that's what's so scary about it. I mean, this is just the, the, this is just the MO of our political culture. There, there are no boundaries. There are no ethics. There is no standard. There are no working definitions to go off of. It's, it's whatever you want it to mean. Rape is whatever you want it to mean. Illegal is whatever you want it to mean. Equity is whatever you want it to mean. I mean, it's all so narcissistic driven. It's you completely in the context of just you. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It's all about you and how you're feeling right now and what you want and what your agenda is. That's, that's, not, that's not humane. That is, that is a, a, a perversion of what it means to be human. That's taking the, the human language, uh, uh, the human existence, the, 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 the reality of consciousness and, and the ability for human beings to recognize nuance and manipulating them to your own wicked, wicked ambitions. That's disgusting. And, and I say it, and I don't think that it really registers to people how common this has become. This has become common. I used the OnlyFans example before, and it was, you know, I, I think it just went right over people's heads, and people, people more so think I'm, I'm being funny, but I'm not being funny. I mean, imagine that you believe that your, your independence is, uh, your, you, that you've achieved independence by taking prostitution to a more digital platform and, and letting OnlyFans take a percentage, and you're still not getting pimped. And that is what a lot of women think. I mean, a lot of women are online constantly now uh, sort of uh, gloating about their, their ability to, to have a, a reasonably high income, especially in this economy, uh, a, a relatively high income, monthly income, based on OnlyFans and selling nudity. And I'm not even saying that if you sell nudity and then, the, you know, there's a man on the other side of that transaction, then you're not independent. But what I'm saying is OnlyFans itself. And I'm not getting down on OnlyFans. I really don't mean to because I know OnlyFans now is trying to you know, spread their wings and try to expand into other types of, of, of digital influencers. And they kind of want to shake this this entire, uh, you know, brand of, of being the, the, the sort of sexual marketplace for for. Um, you know, for young women, I, I actually think that they're trying to shake that. But it is what it is. I mean, OnlyFans is the the premier place where young women go to sell uh, nude pictures and videos and, and you know, pornographic content and, and so on and so forth. And they're making a lot of money doing it. And imagine thinking that you've achieved independence that way. But then we want to talk about the sexual morality of Donald Trump. I mean, and it's, I go back to the Fifty Shades of Grey because it's such an important point to make. What, what are the definitions here? What is the definition of rape? And what we've done is we've created such a, an open-ended an open -ended definition of everything in the English language that any of these definitions can be weaponized at the, at the opportune time to really railroad any person, any man who steps up to challenge the status quo. And that's what we're seeing going on here with Donald Trump. And I wouldn't be surprised if you saw it with me as well. In fact, I've already survived me two allegations before, right here in Minnesota. What do you think was the, when I marched, this, and this is what's funny about it, because I've actually experienced it firsthand. When I marched 15,000 people to the Federal Reserve and I wanted to talk about uh, the, the, the way that the money works, the way that the system works, when we say the system is guilty, when I wanted to really pinpoint the source of that guilt where that moral decision is made and influences the entire rest of the system, the entire rest of the way that Americans live, our, our quality of life, our standard of life. When I wanted to do, to do that, what do you think the first thing they turned to to try and discredit me? Me too. Obvious.
Of course. Because we have a we have a decadent sexual culture. We have a and, and even if we don't want to call it decadent, because you know, why be that judgmental? I'm not gonna play that. I'm not gonna play God in that way. Christians have their beliefs about sexual ethics and morals. Other people have their beliefs about it. Fine. Let's say that we have a very uh uh hypersexual culture in this country. That can't be refuted. So in a hypersexual culture, and I mean generations of a hypersexual culture, most men have had a number of sexual encounters. That's just the, the truth. Even my good friend AJ, who's a devout Catholic, you talk about him in his past life, before he was, before he was baptized, before he was saved and, and, and became a Catholic. So all of these men, no matter who they are today, probably come from, not all these men, but a good portion of men, come from a past that has some sexual encounter. Now, all of those men, all of those men in their sexual encounters can be called upon to discredit them when they stand up to challenge the status quo. Do you see the dangers of this movement? Do you see how we've become a jerk off and cuck society? Do you see how women have been weaponized to preserve the status quo? And, and I use the Federal Reserve as an example because I don't think people quite understand how the expansion of the federal government, the expansion of the money supply, the expansion of this globalist agenda and this sort of Ponzi scheme that plays upon the, 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 the call to give people more rights is actually just a way to, to backstop using women's rights and the women's movement and women in general to, to take people's freedom. That They're just taking freedom. They're using women to take people's freedom. And I know this, I have this intimate understanding of it because they're using black people the same way. They're using black people and women to take people's freedom. They're claiming to, to care about the, the well-being of black people and women, and they're using the two ad nauseum to push their political agenda. And they always come back to the same two issues. I mean, you can just see it. Donald Trump's a racist. Donald Trump's a rapist. He's a racist. He's a rapist. That's, that's the go-to move. But it's not just him. That's going to be the go-to move for any man, any heterosexual man who stands up and wants to challenge the status quo, this corrupt status quo, this Ponzi scheme of an overgrown, grandiose federal government. Any man who stands up to challenge that status quo is going to face those type of criticisms. Is going to face those allegations. You watch, it's going to be another 7 to 14 days before they get catch wind that my Senate candidacy really has some juice, and it's going to be here in the local newspaper. I, I mean, it's just, it's just, you can just see it coming. It's not even about women. They're just using women. And the sad part is women are allowing themselves to be used. And, the, and, and again, I'm not just picking on women. This is, the, this is what the, the, this podcast is about. But black people are allowing themselves to be used the same way. Do you even understand the issues to understand the ideas that would help change the circumstance that you, don't, that you say you don't like? Do you even know enough about what you're talking about to be talking about it, to have formed an opinion about it? I mean, everybody, opinions are like assholes and elbows. Everybody's got them. That's a saying from the neighborhood. Opinions are like assholes and elbows. Everybody has them. But is your opinion really me worth anything? And what makes an opinion worth something? Is knowledge one of them? Is, is wisdom one of them? Is, is having the right information one of them? Is that, is that something that, that helps determine whether or not your opinion is valid? And when it comes to this Me Too and, and, and sexual politics movement, one of the, when it comes to Donald Trump and, and trying to say whether or not he's a morally good person and calling him a rapist, are we going to acknowledge that Fifty Shades of Grey was one of the most popular books for a reason? Are we going to acknowledge that there's a BDSM culture that's on, the, that's t on a tear right now through the entire American mainstream media, let alone the, the, the broader culture in private? Rihanna BDSM, Taylor Swift BDSM, uh, uh, before she, you know, she had her latest uh, transformation, Miley Cyrus was hinting at it. You know, it, it, all of them. 
All of them, the entire Hollywood culture is obsessed with BDSM. And whatever floats your boat, I'm not here to judge. You're an American citizen. I'm not going to be coming into your house. I don't, I don't ever advocate that the federal government have the capacity to surveil you in your home or to come in and knock on your home and, and come into your home and tell you how you should be interacting with another individual. What you should be doing, what, what type of sex you should be having. About. I'm, I'm, the government ain't, is, people aren't even morally righteous enough to, to operate a government like that. Nowhere near. We're so far from, from that level of righteousness, it's actually rightfully considered an a, a impossibility. But we, we, we do have some signs. We do have some indicators of what we find intriguing, what people are into. People love Fifty Shades of Grey. And, and, don't, and of course, you know, what, what, what does the Fifty, Grays of Shade, uh, 50 Shades of Grey story really, really tell us? It's not just that a, a man that, you, that you're attracted to can, uh, has a different set of boundaries sexually, whether consented to or not. And that's what the story is saying. Not only that, but, but a man's material and professional status have a huge impact on that, on that boundary as well. Sir, I mean, honestly, is that, is that the culture we want to have? Is that the sort of delusion we want to live in? You know, that, that it's only okay to tie you up, tie, tie me up and paddle me and, and, and beat me, and, and, you know, and blindfold me or, or whatever else. It's only okay to do that if you're a, a, a titan of the manufacturing and steel industry. I mean, and this just goes to show you, I mean, of course, you need, of course it was a woman who wrote the, the, the Fifty Grades of Shades story who has, obviously has no clue well, you know, the lay of the land in the American steel manufacturing business. There are no, there are no 28 year old tycoons. There are no 28 year old uh, majority stakeholders in the uh, American steel manufacturing business who were self-made. Okay. Give me a fucking break. Okay. The fantasy is so it's not even realistic. It, it I mean, just on it, on face value, there are no, 28 year old, uh, you know, American steel manufacturing tycoons, they don't even exist. They really don't exist. It's just ridiculous. But if you are, a, a, you know, an American steel manufacturing tycoon and you have enough money to buy the newspaper that I want to write at, because obviously I went to school for some popcorn, you know, degree like in English or, or you know, psychology or, or whatever it is, you know, one of these, one of these majors that's uh, of the social sciences or hu humanities where you can just, you know, say your thoughts. And if you, you put enough word salad together, then obviously you can get a passing grade in it. university as long as you keep paying. I mean, right. If you want to pay to end up being a dummy, fair play to you. We'll, we'll allow, we'll open our doors for that all day long. I mean, we have a whole, now our lawyers and our, our engineers and, and our, our biologists, our, our, our people who need to create gain of function viruses, we got to make sure that they know what the fuck they're doing. But you people over in the social sciences, it's just a huge racket to get people to come into college, pay their money to let them pretend that they're smart and then go on to, to serve as, as people who pretend they're smart on CNN. <laughs> that is really the racket. I just thought of it in real time, but but anyway, so, you know, in, in the Fifty Shades of Grey movie, uh, he had enough money to buy the newspaper that she was working on, or buy the, uh, the, the, the editorial or, or the literary house or the publishing company that she, was, that she was working at, that she was interning at. And then, you know, obviously he could move her up the ranks. So, so when a man moves you up the ranks, when a man uses his position of power to, to uh, you know, to, to romance you, it's okay, as, as long as it's what you, what you really want. Are you catching my drift? We have a real issue. We have a real woman issue in this country. We really do. We absolutely do. And to go back to my main point, uh, the, the, the point of it is um, women, women are being used 
Women are being used um, to stifle the rise of any leaders, great leaders, but even decent leaders, uh, to change the status quo. And the same people who are using that status quo that ultimately don't benefit women, that are a net negative against women, that, that don't give women economic independence or that don't give American w- women who are American citizens more value in their citizenship, that, that, that don't give them better job opportunities. Hell, we're sending all the, the, the jobs that women used to work away. We sent, we're, we're sent, through automation and, and the fourth industrial revolution, we will send away a good majority of the jobs that women used to work. Telephone operators, clerks, administrators, uh, bank tellers, grocery store workers, all of the automation and, 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 and smart technology and things like that are, are going to crush that entire job market. We're taking away jobs from women and we're telling them, sign up for OnlyFans. And you think that's independence? Or maybe you do because that work is easier. And then you have to ask yourself a question. If work is easy, is it really meaningful? If your work is too easy, is it really meaningful? And that's a question that women have to ask themselves. And, and like I said, the video that I'm going to show at the end kind of you know, encapsulates a, a, a sort of psychosis that's taken root about the relationship between women and work and money and security and economic independence and, and you know, as it pertains to men and the dynamic between men and women. And it's just a whole shit show that we have to start to sort out. And I'm happy to do it because one of the things from being a professional athlete, I have been involved with a number of women, and I do understand this dynamic at a fundamental level. I really do. And the sexual dynamic included. And I'm willing to talk about it. And if it's too squeamish for you, then get ready for the gulags, motherfucker, because this will be the issue that they're going to use to stifle all of your presidential type leaders, all of your government type leaders, any of your leaders. Any of your leaders in any industry, this is going to be the go-to move to discredit them when, when nothing else works, when they can't discredit the ideas. They can't discredit Donald Trump's ideas. So where do they go after him? They go after him economically. They go after him monetarily. They go after him in kangaroo courts. They go after him with sexual impropriety and moral, moral, uh, you know, moral transgression. Because you don't have to measure those, you don't have to measure those things. Last clip here I'm going to show you because I got off on a tangent there, but this last clip I thought was was very uh, was very interesting. Um, Barack Obama here. <laughs> Barack Obama talking about immigration. I mean, hey, I mean you can talk about you can talk about illegal immigration and immigration with a full throat if you're Barack Obama. And if you're trying to get elected to office, because I guess, you know, Republicans are so bad, you know, the, the, the end justifies the means. If you have to lie, if you have to tell a bold faced lie, if you have to run a campaign on a set of ideas and have such a, a stark position as this, when you get into office, you can change that position. You can lead the, the great invasion of, of, of the 21st century here in America from, from illegal immigrants. No problem. As long as you protect women's right to choose. You don't have to tell us the truth. You don't have to love us. You don't have to care about us. You don't have to actually protect us from the illegal immigrants. As long as you protect our right to choose on paper, as long as you tell us you love us, that's good enough for us. It's not going to be a free ride. It's not going to be some instant amnesty. What's going to happen is you are going to pay a significant fine. You are going to learn English. You are going to go to the back of the line so that you don't get ahead of somebody who was in Mexico City applying legally. It's not something that is guaranteed or automatic. You've got to earn it. I think the American people, they appreciate and believe in immigration. But they can't have a situation where you just have half a million people pouring over the border without any kind of mechanism to control it. So we've got to deal with that at the same time as we deal in a humane fashion with folks who have put down roots here, have become our neighbors, have become our friends, they may have children who are U.S. citizens. That's the kind of comprehensive approach that we have to take. All right? This has been another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio, powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. 
We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I'm your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast. We appreciate you being here today. We, we thank you for your viewership and listenership today and in the future. Uh, we're going to be talking about this more because I guarantee you Jean Carroll won't be the last of, of the women to stand up and, and call Donald Trump a, a, a rapist or, or a, you know, some type of uh, abuser or so on and so forth to, to, to discredit the ideas. And those ideas are the, the border, the debt, the forever wars. We got to close the border. We got to pay back the debt. We got to stop getting involved in forever wars. If we want to make this 2024 election cycle about, about sexual morality, about the standards and ethics of our sexual culture, be my guest. But let's actually have that conversation and figure out what those standards and ethics are. Because when I watch Fifty Shades of Grey, when I watch the mainstream Hollywood culture that we have now, when I listen to all these A-list singers and actresses, when I, when I watch reality TV, when I, when, I, when I hear or see what's being said on the, in the comments section of some of this content that's out there on, on Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, when I see the sexual culture that's been built, I'm having trouble figuring out what you all think those standards actually are. So let's start to sort that out. The fight continues. As always, Godspeed. I don't even know how much money I have anymore. Like, I have a money guy. I don't know what the hell his name, his name even is, to be honest with you, poor guy. He sends me an invoice every month. He pays himself. Every time I want to buy something nice, new, or like expensive, I just call him. I'm like, bro, can I buy this? He's like, yeah, you're good. So I don't care how much money I have. All I know is that the second I ask him for something and he says no, then I'll freak out. Otherwise, don't know how much my bills are, car payments, nothing. He takes care of it. He could be robbing me and I, had no, I would have no idea. As long as I want something and I can have it, don't care. Simple. 